Hello, I'm David Griffiths. I'm a GP in Oxford and I'm an associate of NHS Improving Quality. I'm passionate about quality improvement and the chance it gives us to improve our working lives and the lives of our patients. This is the second of three lessons about the tool, the driver diagram, and you've heard already from my colleague Tom Margin. This is a reminder of what a driver diagram looks like, the skeleton if you like. This is a hypothesis. We are suggesting that if we make a change on the right hand side that it will influence the drivers in the middle of the diagram and have an effect of improving the system and leading towards the aim that we've specified. It's a, uh, it reads from right to left, that's very important to remember. Just to recap, Tom took you through a lot of the potential benefits of driver diagrams in the first session, those are highlighted in green here. So in this lesson, we're going to be focusing uh, largely on a sort of strategic level change, so bigger, more complex changes and how the driver diagram can help us to deconstruct those difficult problems to get better solutions, how we can use it to engage our staff and our patients and the public into in the change that we propose, and how we can avoid certain common and key problem areas such as silver bullet thinking and blind spots. So let's move straight into silver bullet thinking. It's probably apparent what this means, but it's essentially the idea that there's one simple answer to any problem. And of course, it's human nature to want to find that answer and to implement it as quickly as possible. Let's look at a real world example from a GP surgery. So this comes from a real surgery, but the conversation is being had all around the country at the moment. Everybody is struggling with access, of course. In this case, a couple of influential people in the surgery felt they knew the answer and they wanted to bring in telephone triage, the solution to the problem. Now, unfortunately, when they did this, it was an immensely stressful time. Everybody in the practice found it very difficult. The patients didn't like it and actually it didn't appear to improve access at all. There were a lot of reasons why that was the case. But one of the main ones was uh, elucidated by this chap, Henry Louis Mencken, who's a, a writer, the sage of Baltimore. He wrote in the early part of the 20th century. And um, he said, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Complex problems require complex solutions. And the driver diagram is one tool that can help you come up with the solutions that you might want to implement. So when the team actually tried to develop a driver diagram, they had a really useful conversation at the start about what exactly their aim was. And they defined it thus. Now, telephone triage is one possible way of improving access. There's no question about that. But when they came up with a lot of other ideas, and this is just a selection, this doesn't cover the whole gamut, they discovered that there were lots and lots and lots of different ways that they might improve access, some of which were hitting on completely different uh, parts of the problem that telephone triage was hitting on. And when you draw that out into a driver diagram, and bear in mind that there are a lot of strange ideas here, so we've only managed to summarise a few of them, you can see that actually telephone triage is, has got a lot of potential because it does a lot of different things all at once. And it hits on both uh, reducing demand and increasing capacity, potentially at least. And you can measure those things and see if it works. However, if we bring these other problems forward, we realise that actually telephone triage is interrelated with lots of other possible change um, solutions. And actually, there may be things that are much simpler to implement than telephone triage that you could do tomorrow. And it would be worth possibly doing those things first. Or it may be that actually telephone triage doesn't work without two or three other aspects of this uh, driver diagram and you need to do them together. Complex problems require complex solutions. And I think this is just one example where a driver diagram can really add value. So let's just talk about these complex problems. One of the key benefits of the driver diagram, in fact, in my view, the biggest benefit is in deconstructing problems that appear very tricky. Now, weight loss is uh, the example that Tom used in the first lesson, and it's a fairly simple example. And usually when we uh, go through this with groups and workshops, people find this answer easy to get to. You either reduce the amount of calories you take in or you, or you increase the amount of calories you burn off. That's relatively straightforward. What you're looking for with a driver diagram is something like that for whatever problem, whatever aim 
you have. You want to deconstruct it if at all possible because it moves you forward and gives you a chance to create better ideas. Let's look at a, a, a practice based one. So I know every practice is struggling with uh, ever increasing workload. Let's think about administrative staff, for example. Supposing they want to reduce their workload. Well, I think there are two ways they can do this. They can either somehow reduce the volume of tasks that they're required to complete. And there are lots of different ways you might do that. Or they can reduce the amount of time they actually have to spend on those tasks. And there are a number of different ways that you could do that. If you only focus on one of those things, then you don't get the maximum benefit. So the benefit of the actual the process of the driver diagram is to make sure you don't miss anything, which moves us on to this idea of blind spots. Part of the problem we have in, um, in healthcare, along with any other sector, is that when we try to solve our problems, we usually do that with our colleagues. And our colleagues tend to have the same background, the same kind of training, and the same kind of mindset that we have, the same experiences of life, if you like. That tends to make us think in similar patterns. And so it's quite difficult sometimes to come up with sufficient new ideas, innovative ideas that might help us change. So let's just go back to the weight loss example because it's a nice simple one. If we look here, look down at the bottom here, the increasing calories out section. Now, I know from talking to my patients and indeed from my own life that actually it's very tempting to assume that if you want to increase your calories out, you need to take part in some sort of regular sporting activity. Um, so join the gym, something like that. But the number of people who join the gym and then hardly ever go after the first couple of months is, well, it's a large number, a large proportion, shall we say. The formal structure of the driver diagram here helps us to identify that there may maybe we're lacking ideas in the increasing calories out section. And actually, when we stop to think, there's a whole period of time in the day when we're not going to be doing sport, but maybe we could increase our activity levels. As a GP, maybe I should get up and go and get my patients from the waiting room every time. That would increase my foot, foot my step count hugely. So the driver diagram here is just a way of, um, because of its structured nature, it helps us to identify our gaps and to put in new ideas. A word briefly about engagement. So one problem with change is if uh, we try to implement a new idea and people aren't bought into it, then they won't do it and it will fall by the wayside. In my experience, the driver diagram is an immensely powerful tool for engaging staff. I think that the, the main reason for that is the democratising power of the post-it note. When you get people to write their ideas, if they all write them on the same type of post-it note, every idea is equal whatever their positional status within the organisation. So you might have the senior partner and a junior receptionist. You might have a chief executive and a brand new member of staff, middle manager. Now in a traditional um, brainstorming, a new member of staff might be actually isolated and feel that they cannot put new put ideas forward. And you lose out massively if you don't get them get their ideas on board because they've got fresh eyes. They're seeing things that we no longer see. So the driver diagram is just one way of doing it. It's not the only way, but it's a very powerful tool. And I've seen people come out of sessions hugely energized and excited about the possibilities. I want to say something here about strategy. And we have experience now of, you, of using driver diagrams to try and come uh, to drive strategic planning at um, CCG and multi-CCG level. Everybody's familiar with this concept that strategic plans tend to gather dust on the shelf. And of course, implementation of plans is always difficult. But the point about driver diagrams is that they are a series, a whole range of possible actions, and you can act on them straight away. Some of the ideas will be very complex and they'll take, they'll take the long view. There'll be a two year or five year change. But some of them will be simple and quick to implement, and they can be started tomorrow, gathering momentum for any change that you're, you're undertaking. Now, I think this is a useful quote because actually strategy is basically a hypothesis. When you write a strategy, you are suggesting what you think will happen, but you never really know. And we don't necessarily think of strategies in this way. They need to be dynamic. They need to be iterative. You'll remember from um, Tom's first session, but actually, the, the driver diagram is a great way for testing things out because actually, if you fail, you've got a ready selection of new ideas that you can take off the peg and, and work with. And even if you succeed, you can do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. 
And because they're visual, then everybody in the organization knows where they stand. So hopefully I've covered some of these key points here. And in the next lesson, uh, Tom will be taking you through some of the practicalities of running a driver diagram session, who you get in the room and how you actually uh, generate the ideas and, and get the benefit. Now, just one more real world example before I leave you. So this is a driver diagram that I came up with uh, myself as, a, as an example to use with commissioning groups. Every commissioning group in the country is interested in reducing acute admissions. And I hypothesize that actually there's only, there are only really two ways that you can do that. You can either stop people attending the hospital, and, which means basically looking after them better beforehand or offering them a different service, or you can reduce the conversion to admission. So once they're in the hospital, once they're in A&E or MAU, you can somehow get them out, get them to another type of care or give them care at home. Now, I've highlighted here just one small example, which is uh, the use of a social worker in A&E to uh, facilitate both of these types of things. And you can see that actually it uh, contributes to multiple secondary drivers and to both the primary drivers, potentially at least. I was interested in one of the areas that I delivered this, uh, this slide to hear that they'd actually introduced exactly this idea, a social worker in A&E, and unfortunately, the, uh, the experiment was about to be cancelled because it hadn't really had any impact. No one had actually used the social worker. They couldn't find any work. And my argument to you is if that area, if that acute trust had actually had a driver diagram um, as part of their strategic thinking, they would have seen that the social worker interacted with lots of other different change projects and they would have seen the links and they would have started to put those in place so that people would actually utilise it. And they also would have had a conversation about measurement and how they're going to know whether the change project was effective. And if they'd measured, then they would have been able to spot very early that things weren't happening. They'd have been able to iterate, to do something different, to make it work, or to say much earlier, with much less hassle, this isn't going to work for us. We need to try something else. So as we have discussed in both these lessons, the driver diagram is a great tool. It's really useful, but it's all about what you do with it. And it's all about taking action at the end of the day. So thanks for watching, and I hope you'll tune in for Tom's third lesson in the very near future.